Welcome to Bios Ventures. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Mariana Sanko, co-founder and partner at Future Ventures to the show. Mariana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Let's kick things off. Uh, can you share a brief personal intro with us, Mariana? Yeah, um, I am originally from Ukraine and was fortunate enough to grow up in a household full of engineers. And so I intended to spend my life as an engineer or a research scientist um, and wound up finding myself as a venture capitalist, which is as much a surprise to me as it is possibly to anyone else, including my parents. Um, but I, I delight in this work and in the curiosity it affords. And in the rest of my life, you can usually find me either surfing or mountain biking or climbing. So every moment that's not chatting with founders and learning about the world is spent outside. That's a great set of uh, very complimentary activities. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about them today. So at the risk of maybe asking a leading question, Featuring very prominently on the Future Ventures website is an Alan Kay quote I've always loved, which says, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So before we dive deeper, can you give us a little bit of an intro to Future Ventures? Maybe talk about the core philosophies of the firm? Absolutely. So Future Ventures is a firm that myself and my brilliant co-founder, Steve Jurvetson, founded a couple of years ago. We're a few funds in now, and so the strategy um, that we started with as a vision a couple of years ago is, is really continuing to solidify. And the vision was, what would it look like to be a venture fund that wholly focused on deep tech investments, that did so in a manner that was pretty lean on the team side, so it's just myself and Steve on the investment side. Um, the idea there is that we can really move quickly through decision space. Um, and possibly the, the most important part is to, a founding philosophy of the firm is just understanding that the fundamental technologies that will change our world for the better take a while. And so one of our visions here is to be a slightly more patient form of capital. So our funds are 15 year funds. Our commitment to entrepreneurs is to be long-term investors and, and steady partners by their side. Um, and that's something that Steve has practiced for his entire career and that I've strived towards. And I would say that's one of the fundamental principles of our fund is to understand that the, the biggest things we want to build in the world, um, really take time and consideration. I really like that phrase, patient capital. And on top of that, as you said, it's nice to have a, especially for founders, that ability to move quickly. I'm sure your, I'm sure your portfolio companies appreciate it. But for now, passing it over to Sarah to learn and discuss a little bit more about your own journey to VC. Thank you for those wonderful intros. We'd love to dive deeper and kind of discuss your journey to VC. Um, in undergrad and in grad school, you pursued biomedical engineering, as well as both material science and materials engineering. I'd love to start there right from the beginning. Why biomed and materials? What first brought you to bio? I think my, my parents were immigrants, well, with me to this country, and um, like all good immigrant parents, I had a choice of like three professions, uh, you know, a doctor, lawyer, engineer. Uh, an engineer was last on the list because they were engineers, and they, I think, somewhat rightly looked around the world at that point and said, um, engineers are so necessary, so it's a noble profession, but they're maybe not appreciated enough um or held in the same credibility and so the you know in the small way that an only child can be rebellious i chose one of the three paths but the one that they were least excited about um but my parents are both brilliant mechanical engineers and so i grew up looking at the world from a mechanism standpoint trying to understand how systems fit together on a macro scale and what i realized when i entered university is that i didn't understand anything about the atomistic world, about why materials have their properties. Uh, because mechanical engineers tend to look at materials um, from, from a holistic standpoint of, you know, how does the thing function, not why does it have that function. And I thought that that might be where 
the these fields are are interesting and converging and going and mind you right this is the kind of um that I, I graduated in in the early aughts and so this was kind of the peak of the nanotech movement um and I was always really interested in biology but wanted to look at biology from a more computational and empirical framework because that's kind of how I think about the world and so this mix of materials biomaterials uh, really really stemmed from those two interests that's great that's really exciting um and I, I like how you said you know your parents are, are inspiration but kind of you know diverse a little away from from what they do that's great so from there you explored engineering at Cabot and Lux Research before joining Airbus Ventures what first brought you to venture I I was exceptionally lucky in that um, I was introduced to, uh, at, at the time, the head of the innovation lab at Airbus, uh, Paul Armenko, who went on to become the CTO. And he, he essentially said, we want our venture, our innovation group to run a seed venture fund. Um, and through the course of a really fascinating meal where I didn't quite know what I was signing up for, uh, I essentially gave a diatribe on why I thought corporate venture capital always fails. Uh, and at the end of the dinner, he said, well, could you do something different? Um, and I thought about it and I said, I don't, I don't know. I think it would be hard. It would really go against the grain of the incentive structures of these large organizations. Um, and a couple of days later, he and the team at Airbus offered me a job to uh, essentially help restructure the Airbus early stage venture fund, uh, which I thought was effectively um, and lovingly destined for failure. But the job also included moving to California. So I figured, let's give it a go. Uh, and it was a really spectacular experience and one I'm deeply grateful for and um, look back on my time at Airbus with deep fondness. But uh, really thought that the the thing that I was most excited about venture was venture more broadly, as in venture outside of aerospace, and that's why I went on to to um, DFJ at the time, and then Coso Ventures. That's great, very exciting. So I guess hopping off of that right there, that comment, you explored roles uh, with VC firms like DFJ and and Colsa. Uh, focusing on frontier tech investments before you then co-founded Future Ventures. Can you tell us more about your motivations to explore venture firms and maybe a few takeaways from your experience? Yeah, I, I kind of joke that um, there's this opening in Anna Karenina that, you know, all happy families are happy in the same way and all unhappy families are unhappy in unique and exciting ways all on their own. Uh, that's kind of like venture funds, right? They're they're each families, and so there's a lot of love inside them um, and mutual respect, and yet they all have their own flavors. And I realized that to do well in this space, you really kind of need to plant your feet and figure out in what framework you are going to be the most efficacious. Um, and so I had I had some spectacular opportunities both at DFJ and COSLA to see how to large, prolific, incredible institutions run. Their, their values, their differences. I, I think the things that I can say about both are they're full of brilliant people who deeply care. Um, there's a different scale and size to each operation. Um, both, both organizations were quite large. And at the end of the day, what I realized was that I'm best suited at looking at a particular style of company. And that is a small subset of the total number of companies that either of those larger firms would ever get to look at. And so in terms of keeping myself at my best and highest use and um, being honest to my colleagues around me, uh, Steve and I decided to start Future Ventures to say, well, what are the kinds of companies that we're uniquely positioned to fund? Um, and just respect that other partnerships have much broader mandates. Yeah, that's a, that's a great intro as, as to why you started your own firm. But I'm curious, you know, what is the flavor of future of future ventures? What what do you guys want to be known for? Zesty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I think 
one of the things that I most appreciate about Steve and that I was so excited to continue our working together, we had worked together at um, DFJ, was his perennial curiosity. And it's a, it's a, a flavor and a way of being that I really hope carries forward in our fund, which is Steve has a lot of bias. Any, any technical person develops bias, right? The, the deeper you dig into a field, the more you're pretty sure you know what's going on. What I was most impressed with in first working with Steve years ago, and that's only become more true now at Future Ventures, is the willingness to walk into a meeting with an enormous amount of bias and then have it completely turned around, have a, have a brilliant entrepreneur who presents a new perspective on an existing field that you thought you knew and the capacity to turn on a dime and say, oh, I believe that, that that's a framing that resonates. And so I think I hope that I hope that's what we create at Future Ventures is that kind of curiosity, that willingness to revisit all of the ways in which we might feel stagnant in the world and find solutions in places where people have stopped looking. Very interesting. While we're on that topic, do you have any advice for those considering launching their own venture firms? L lean into your capacities, right? Every Every entrepreneur is looking for a sounding board and someone that they're going to resonate with. It's a pretty lonely job as an entrepreneur and they need as much support as they can get. And so the best thing that you can do is kind of be an Archimedean point, an anchor around which you say, okay, we start here. This is what we know. And then from there, you can expand in all directions, right? But, but to start, like for us, it's from the principle of, we, we understand the challenges and trials and tribulations of early stage deep tech startups. They're all different and yet the, the style and the aesthetic of the challenges they run into is somewhat similar. And I think for all, all potential VCs, there's a, there's a mix of follow your curiosity, but start from something you know. I was gonna say, I love that you've talked about curiosity as one of your driving forces. And we know at Future, you focus in many cases on seed and early stage investment, often in trailblazing and uh, purpose-driven entrepreneurs with what you might say are unique ideas that have the potential to reinvent often entire industries. So and in your role, you invest uh, more broadly than aerospace today, also into things like robotics, quantum computing, blockchain, the future of food. I guess we'd, we'd be curious to understand how do you think about and develop your investment theses? It's it's a mix of kind of guided research and consideration and thought and, and emergent behavior. So for example, a, a couple of years ago, um, I think I just, I became painfully aware of the somewhat barbaric state of um, the vast majority of therapies in and around women's health. Uh, particularly around the medical profession's attitude towards uh, pain management, uh, long-term pain management, uh, but also broadly, right? Like no one, very few people want to talk about menopause, uh, much less developing um, therapies, which is crazy because it's something that 50% of the world's population go through, right? It's, it's are huge markets. Uh, but I didn't really know where to start. And so it was a uh, slow going. It was a couple of years of attending the occasional conference every time that I was visiting a university, making sure that I um, tried to get on the calendar of one of the people who I perceived as an expert in the field and just kind of learning through that osmotic process of what are the field's largest challenges? And then over time, trying to understand which ones of them might be tractable in the kind of medium term. And out of that, we we came out with an investment uh, called Gamito, but you know that was on the tail end of a couple of years of interest and work. And I think that's kind of how it always happens for us is this mm -hmm. inkling that, oh, there's something interesting potentially happening in the space. Um, on the flip side, occasionally, you know, you, you, maybe you've 
perhaps we've all heard, hopefully at this point, of the challenge of global colony hive colony collapse for bees, right? We're, we're going through this massive attrition in bees. What I hadn't realized is what a large percentage of our global food is actually grown um, from, from crops that still require pollination from bees. And so with a robotics background, you know, I looked at robotic bees, I looked at, uh, it, it, you know, I essentially tried to thought about all of the ways in which we could over-engineer uh, our way out of that solution. And we ended up investing in a company that is called BeeFlow that's maybe the most natural solution, which is, well, what if we just bolster the immune systems of the existing bees, you know, keep them alive, keep them happy, keep them working, um, mm -hmm. increase their capacity to reproduce. And I, I think that's an example of, we were tangentially aware of the problems in the field, um, but perhaps not as informed on all of the ways in which solutions had been tried until we really met the company that kind of walked us through, here's the state of the field. So while we try to have a prepared mind, we also try to be open to the, the times in which uh, the thesis kind of walks in the door. Oh, and keeping that curiosity alive, I suspect, makes you particularly, I'm going to use the term susceptible to that, which is great. But at the same time, uh, you're also a two-person team, as you mentioned, and given your investments across so many different areas, is is it just this long uh, few years of prep before you really feel like you develop domain expertise and can differentiate yourself in space? I guess I'm just curious, how do you make sure you're keeping abreast of the technologies you're investing in? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And I would, I would say it's a bit of a dance. Um, you know, there, there's certainly, there will be things that we miss mm -hmm. fundamentally. One of the ways that we try to stay ahead of the curve is rather than being in the space of kind of the, the finer points of the minutia of, um, ink, increasing along the efficiency ladder of any particular technology. So for example, I, I don't think Steve or myself are informed on the latest uh, acute shifts to different type of machine learning algorithms that are, that are causing us to kind of crawl up that efficiency ladder. Um, in the same way that we maybe more holistically have looked at, for example, like the steel making market um, and have said, Okay, well, here here's a space where there's very little investment happening. What what are the kind of the broad stroke shifts in this industry? So what we try to do is stay ahead of the curve and the investment cycle, such that one of our when when we make an investment in a space, it'll generally be kind of one of the first companies in the space. And what we really like about that is it also has this really nice secondary factor, which is those companies tend to attract the top talent in their fields. And there's less of this kind of distribution of talent across a hundred different startups, roughly all working in the same space. It happens eventually, but you know maybe they have a couple of years of runway to get out ahead of the rest of the field. And on top of that, when you're working with the top talent, you get to learn more. And exactly. so that all makes a lot of sense. And as you mentioned this earlier, Futures Fund has a 15 year time horizon, which is on average five years longer than many funds. So. Exactly. This gives you not only leeway into making long-term bets, but also to exercise that curiosity about technologies that can be a little more revolutionary. So how do you think about then the time horizon across um, the rest of VC? Do you feel like there's a need at this point for more investors to shift to a longer-term investment model? I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, the concept of delayed gratification, right? The, the marshmallow experiment. Um, which actually I think was largely disproven. Um, it was it, it it was just an unfortunately biased study, but uh, it comes I, with the immigrant background and the first gen background too. I think so. That's right. Uh, so so um, one slightly uh, poorly uh, constrained uh, psych experiment aside, I I do fundamentally believe that if we can shift uh, people's perspective to saying that. Um, the, the later, longer term gratification of being involved with something, one, pays dividends, right? Like think, simple things like compounding interest, right? We, we know that one of the most basic principles in investing is invest early and hold as long as possible. Um, because that really kind of washes out a lot of the perturbations in the system. 
And it's why I slightly worry about the the mission of a lot of funds seems to be be on the bleeding leading edge of the flash in the pan style investments, right? Um, all of the micro mobility investments that happened and then all of the scooter companies that died, uh, all of the NFT investments and then the crypto market crashes. And I think the challenge with that is yet, yeah, yes, you, um, if you're optimizing for near term dollar count growth, you, you might get lucky and have timed it perfectly. But I would question, what are you building in the world that actually has longevity? Um, and so I would love more people to focus on that. It doesn't, uh, I, I would hope that that's not a novel stream of thought. I'm going to second your hope. <laughs> it's something, but tying some of these things together, historically, it feels like the philosophy of investment in tech has been very different from traditional biotech especially in terms of time horizon and yet to, and culture for that matter. And yet today we're seeing more and more convergence of these two different uh, disciplines with the merging of technology and biology often to develop tech bio platforms, or in many cases, the platform and the uh, information it generates pushing that flywheel is often the most powerful asset. So we'd be curious, um, especially given your breadth of investment, just to hear your thoughts on this trend and where maybe you see some of the frontier technologies coming together to have the greatest impact? Yeah, I, I love this question. I love this trend. Um, I think one of the fundamental ways that we look at the world within the future ventures sphere is what are the ways in which the tools and technologies of today allow us to iterate experimentation cycles um, mm -hmm. more efficiently, faster, uh, with better outcomes. And so I, I've been on the board of a company called Deep Genomics for a number of years, which is mRNA therapeutics as a platform computationally derived. And I love this construct, right? Because if you look at biotech in the past, uh, incredible things have come from the field where we should all be deeply grateful. We should also all probably just be shocked that any medicine ever makes it to market. Um, you know, once you get in the weeds of pre-IND, IND, then the clinical trials, and then you look at the drop-off rates at each one of those, uh, you, you realize just how shocking it is uh, that we have any medicines at all that are reasonably safe and efficacious. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you want to shift, um, shift those ratios for the better. And so while I'm deeply hopeful that the kind of computational advancements, the type of um, AI-driven drug discovery companies that are out there today will work. I am cautious when I hear early stage companies state, oh, you know, we've got this solved. We're going to have 100% translation from our platform to successful phase three clinical trials. And the simple reality is that we need to bridge these kinds of companies between the early stage tech investors, the biotech investors, we need them, we need their expertise, we need their experience in getting to market and in working with the pharma partners, but they're appropriately cautious and skeptical. And so I think one thing that this kind of new biotech field hasn't quite figured out in a stamp and repeat fashion is, is how to traverse that translational gap and how to prove the credibility of these platform companies um, in a way that looks a bit different than just having phase one clinical readouts that everyone agrees are, you know, thumbs up great. And even when you have them to say, this somehow translates to other assets in the portfolio, because at the end of the day, the market is still lopsided. The tech investors are indexing on the platform and the biotech investors are indexing on the asset. No, and I think it's going to take a bit of time, as you're saying, before we really see that convergence come together. And also, as we were saying up front too, there, this is a lengthy life cycle to get from uh, initial discovery design through IND into the clinic for readout. We're maybe five years into what you might call tech bio. And so yep. it's just starting to see some of those companies get there. And you mentioned uh, deep minds, um, deep genomics, deep genomics, forgive me, being one of them. So excited to see where they, where they take this. Me and too. So let's, <laughs> well, let's, let's take this a step further and in a slightly different direction. 
Uh, you talked about beef flow earlier, and the I feel like the argument could be made that we're only just beginning to see serious investment from a broad swath of VCs into bio, specifically bio-driven innovation for sustainability and what we might call planetary health. And so when selecting area of, areas of investment, what led you at Future to help lead this charge? I think for me and Steve, it was as simple as pausing and saying, you know, Future Ventures is our life's work. We, we raised two $200 million funds to date. We'll raise a third one soon. That's, that's a lot of responsibility to take on. And if we are given this exceptional privilege of getting to manage the flow of this capital, which I, I do believe can do some profound good in the world, where do we want to focus those efforts? And for me, it was so strikingly clear that, you know, I, I love space and aerospace and the concept of humans becoming an interplanetary species. Um, and I will steal this phrase from my uh, fiance who worked at SpaceX for years. We already live on a pretty good spaceship. It's, it's quite exceptional. It, it ferries a lot of humans through the universe. And I'd love to work on Spaceship Earth. I think that I'm, I'm a huge fan of the outdoors and of appreciating all of the natural beauty around us. And I don't love the conversation today around climate change, which has been so pessimistic and um, with an attitude that humans are only parasitic on the face of the earth. And I, I just fundamentally believe in our capacity and our creativity to be stewards and for technology to be the tool that allows us to become the gardeners that I think humans can be of this planet. I like that. I, I also agree with the climate change sentiment. It's nice to, to hear some optimism. So we're going to transition to uh, talking about the firm's assessment and investments. Um, building on what you've said so far, you and your team have made some incredible investments in the biopharma space, including 64X Bio, Osmind, uh, Prelis Biologics, uh, perhaps using these companies as an example. Can you share more about the future diligence process? And how do you separate signal and noise when evaluating companies? Ooh, uh, it's not easy. Um, especially, you know, one of the great challenges is that a lot of really, really brilliant people walk in through this, through our doors and chat with us. And we, we in turn have to say, yes, I understand that you're an expert in your field, but I don't believe what you're saying. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's potentially not the most comfortable conversation. Um, it also leaves a lot of opportunity to second guess yourself. And so I, I think first and foremost is we really try to understand the team, their backgrounds, why they're uniquely qualified to build this technology. Um, one of the nice things about our investment thesis is because we invest around fun foundational shifts in technology, we really you know, we, we really have to go to ground on that and understand what, what is the aha moment that this team had technically and why can they potentially build a moat around it, at least for some period of time. And so we really, we really focus in on that asset. Now, what, what aspect, um, what, what's interesting is thankfully, uh, science is really good at this, right? The, like as a whole is to, to understand the, the credibility of any particular uh, scientific thought or academic lineage. And so there's actually a lot of resources that you can go back to, right? You can talk to people's graduate advisors. You can understand if they are part of kind of the, the leading edge of the field. Um, the, the next piece that's really important for us is how willing is the market to shift? Right. So a lot of times brilliant technology is brought to market, but there's just not an incentive structure on the user side, whether those users be large industrial players, farmers, in the case of things like B-Flow or Verdant Robotics, um, uh, the, the actual um, users of any particular technology need to A, have the buying power, B, the motivation, 
uh, and and C recognize that the the solution that's coming to them is solving an actual problem of theirs. It might be, but sometimes you know the the receiving end just doesn't care or hasn't come aware of the problem. And so we try to mitigate that market risk by really saying, who are your customers? Let us talk to them uh, and and really getting ahead of that. It's not so much about them having exact customer contracts so much as a customer saying, I'm drowning without this solution. I need it yesterday, um, which we do hear a fair bit. In fact, most of the time. Um, and every time we don't, whenever we hear that, oh, this is interesting, we'll kick the tires on it, we'll run a pilot project, it, you know, it, th then you kind of have to squint and, and think about um, wh what are the ways in which uh, this technology can, can find a home. Because I, I think we're, we're sensitive to when you have a really, really nice hammer that's going around looking for nails. Yeah, yeah. Technology enthusiasm is is I imagine very important in, in the venture space. So speaking of the user consumer shift that you just mentioned on the biosustainability side, um, you've helped lead the charge in future of food companies, investing in startups like Upside Foods. So focusing on your expertise in that future of food for a movement, when we think about what we might call the sin bio side of biotech, there's often a need for companies to possess both scientific and commercial marketing skill sets, especially for companies that are more direct to consumer like Upside Foods. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how to consider assessing teams and companies in this particular space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're also investors in, in New Culture, um, which is a, a um, company that's focusing on making the casein uh, protein, which is central to cheese. They're focused on mozzarella and, and better meat, which is um, mm -hmm. growing uh, a protein from a, a mushroom base. And, and so, you know, as we focus on these scientists, you have to pause and say, okay, now how does this team think about who the end user is? And I would say that Uma and the team at Upside Foods were so spectacular. Uh, at this from the earliest days. Um, they really, from the very beginning, were thinking about meat, meat eaters. How do you speak to them? How are you? How do you cautiously present the upsides of um, things like uh, growing meat in this clean way without giving people that, that concerning, you know, lab grown just sounds terrible. It's also not an appropriate expression of what the product actually is. I think one of the things that I've been really grateful for is the extent to which um, brilliant people in marketing, communications, brand building are so driven into these spaces. Um, I'm on the board of a company called Earthshot and they're they're focused on uh, re regenerative um, uh, reforestry projects globally for to to address the carbon economies and and actually make them viable for for peoples all over the world. And you know, a, a really famous filmmaker got on the phone with me yesterday, and she was like, "How do I tell this story? I want to work with this team. I want to figure out how we frame this so people really understand how important it is." And so I would say that this, well, maybe a couple of years ago. I would have said, you know, if this team doesn't have the best marketing person already in house, they're in trouble. It's really shifting. Um, there's so much talent, so many people who are, um, I can't tell you how many people from the marketing profession I've talked to who are essentially saying, I'm sick of selling people things they don't want or need. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody wants that profession and it, people, people want to feel good about their work. And so what I feel fortunate is to say, well, here's a whole field of things that you can you can go lend your skills to and and um, be really proud of the work you're doing. The regulatory side is different though. That's the one thing I'll pause on is that these companies need to have an exceptionally clear, concise, and thoughtful framework about how to address the various regulatory challenges in their space. And that's one where you know in-house expertise and talent um, really is an accelerator. Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very important consideration. So taking a step back and thinking more broadly, 
Do you have any recommendations for founders reaching out to future? I'll give this on two, two axes. Um, the, the first is, uh, it's not, it's probably not too early to reach out. Uh, we, I, I occasionally talk to founders. It's more likely that you're too late for us than too early. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and then the other aspect is if you are, uh, um, I've, I've unfortunately found this to be true uh, among a number of the brilliant female entrepreneurs who come and pitch to us, but this is true more broadly, which is if you are the kind of person who speaks softly and whose work carry, speaks for itself, remember that we only have a short amount of time together. And so you really do need to just own your work and point out how it is a foundational shift. And don't let that be something someone later discovers hiding under a rock. Um, and so I, I think that we have the fortune of uh, working with and speaking to a lot of people who are doing profound work in the world. Please don't make it feel like pulling teeth to extract from you how great you are. Yeah, that's great advice. Something we can all keep in mind. So I'd like to pivot uh, slightly and talk about Futures Portfolio Support. For their companies. Um, you've written that Future supports passionate founders who are forging the future, and I'd love to dive deeper into that, that phrase. What does being a good partner to your portfolio companies mean at Future? I, I think it means, first and foremost, listening to where they are, right? Um, I have had the experience of a some investors feel that they need to have confidence that they know what all of the right answers are and that uh, when their entrepreneurs ask them a question that they must have a specific answer, usually, ideally, you know, um, built up by a, a lot of data from their own portfolio. And I think that doesn't quite appreciate the fact that you know, every company is a unique flower and you do need to hear what they're actually struggling with and thinking about. Um, and so I think what, what we do endeavor to do is, is in, in line with being patient capital, also understanding, okay, what is the longer arc of the company you're building here? And how is each decision you're making today set you up for success in that? I think the other aspect is, you know, between companies in our portfolio, like SpaceX um, and Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Um, th these are, uh, Commonwealth is focused on um, building small uh, fusion plants to, to basically have limitless renewable energy. How great would that be? Uh, these, these companies have the challenge of scaling exceptionally strong engineering teams. And while they look a little bit different, the, the, the constructs that they operate within are somewhat similar. And so we, we have, you know, we'll never poach from one company to another in terms of talent, but we will say, here are frameworks that have worked. Here are questions you should be asking. Here, here are ways in which you can think about hiring for these kinds of positions. Um, and then perhaps the most important is we just endeavor to open our networks. Uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to be connected with some pretty spectacular people on earth and our founders know that, you know, they, they can ask for those connections and we'll do everything in our power to enable the ones that we think will be um, mo most useful and in the time that they're, they're best suited for those connections. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about that, that longer arc um, networking and, and hiring, when we think about the lengthy lifestyle of visionary companies, especially those in the biospace, building teams and company culture with intention is critical. This is especially true in tech bio, where we, we're seeing increasing interdisciplinarity of tech and biotech. And so given that team building is so crucial, how do you think about supporting founders as they build these teams and company cultures? Yeah, it's, it's so hard, right? I, I have so much respect for the fact that there's this balance between, um, between 
how long it takes to hire the perfect team and the fact that the work needed to be done last week and you're already slipping on all the deadlines and whatever contractors you're working with um, are probably also behind schedule. And, you know, sometimes you just need a warm body in the room. Um, and then every, I would say every entrepreneur has this dream vision of uh, the exact right person who can cross collaborate. I, I think a couple of things are good guiding principles, which is one, trust your gut and your intuition, um, which also, which means, you know, if you're thinking about bringing in a person and you really, really need a person and the person you're interviewing who seems great on paper, you just have a not great feeling about, don't hire them because it will take you way longer than you'll think is reasonable to fire them. And in the process, um, you, you won't have built the system that you need. I think the other thing is, um, and this can be hard to hear, but uh, uh, setting yourself up for success early, right? So if you want a diverse team um, because cognitive diversity leads to better outcomes, you need to hire for that from the beginning. You can't start thinking about that. Thinking about that even 20 people in is too late. Um, and and I've, I've found this to be amazing. I was at a, an event with primarily female entrepreneurs and they were basically saying that they're overrun with female candidates. Uh, and, you know, at this point they need to hire some white guys to just look like they're not, you know, antagonistic towards them. And on the counter front, right, I know so many companies who are desperately looking for, uh, uh, talent from different fields and different backgrounds, uh, who just can't seem to get the inflow. And it, it's because candidates, they emulate leadership, right? So if they, they feel that if there's a safe place for them uh, within a company, it's because they recognize something within the leadership, uh, that resonates with them. And so starting as early as possible on that is your best bet for success. Absolutely. Absolutely. Taking that in a slightly different direction in a post pandemic world where work from home is commonplace, but companies in the tech biospace need to be partially in person in labs, in addition to, uh, roles that might be remote. How do we kind of balance those two uh, push and pull at the at the company and, and while we're allowing for those to work remotely, they can, but also encourage in-person interactions in the office? Yeah, such a good question. And I think top of mind for so many companies right now, especially when you're trying to balance um, your AI computational talent and and feeling the scarcity of that talent and and as an entrepreneur you know you essentially this is attitude of like give those people anything they want because we we need them um, the reality is you need your biologists and your chemists and your bench scientists um, just as much if not more and it is a disservice I believe to those companies to have those two teams be fundamentally disconnected I I think there's a lot you can do through asynchronous communication. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the richness of data that's transferred from in-person interactions, from those ad hoc meetings that, I, and I really do mean in person because I, I think even a Zoom call, even that slight barrier uh, or like a, a Slack message of, you know, the, the activation energy of, oh, let me go find this person, ask them a question and get 10 minutes on their calendar the the small thing that you might have otherwise just popped by their desk with is lost. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking about and we've seen as quite useful in our companies is ensuring that people have the flexibility to live their lives, right? So the top talent, you it, like they're just going to get that flexibility somewhere. So you might as well get it in your company. Uh, and at the same time saying, no, the office has to be a happy and friendly and excited place that you come to and you get to focus in, right? There, there can be a real gift in offering that. And so what we've been seeing as, as quite useful is a couple of days in office that are mandatory for the company. And, and you know, maybe it's like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday or something like that. Um, and and it, people turns out just get excited to go right you you need you you need the you you need this the germination seed you you need that to actually be because you can't do that and then have the founding team like not show up on those days or, or right I, I really think this starts from the top down in the sense that um 
as leaders in your companies, you set culture. And mm -hmm. if you want that kind of interaction, you have to participate in it. No, it's a really strong, as you were saying earlier, leadership role models from the top of the company are what often create the culture and guide the flow. And I know re the most recent example I've heard that I really appreciated was uh, actually an ice cream day where pe once a week, those who were interested in the small team were getting together and they were going around. Everyone sh had chosen their uh, control flavor. And they were just trying all the different ice cream shops in their area. And honestly, that's a company now I want to work at. <laughs> uh, Sign yeah. me up for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we should get something going. Buy us ice cream. Next. <laughs> That'll be next. <laughs> I'm in. Well, we've, we've touched on this, I think, in a number of different forms. But I'd love to ask it open-ended and give the platform to you. How does Future Ventures really differentiate itself? I think... First and foremost, you know, we're, we're small. If you, if you talk to myself or Steve, you've talked to 50% of the partnership. If you talk to both of us, that that's it. Um, and what that means is that there's a real clarity in engaging with us. Um, and I think hopefully what results in that is that there's, there's not a lot of confusion of like, what is the process and who else do I have to engage with and where might I be? Like it, it kind of unfolds pretty naturally. The other thing about us is that while we're quite a small team, our, our funds are reasonably sizable, right? So our, our funds are $200 million funds, which means that we can write one to $10 million starting checks, four to six is kind of our sweet spot. And we found that to be a real sector of need for companies in that, you know, the, these days it's somewhere between a seed extension round or an A. Uh, we really do love to be in, in some of the earliest rounds. The seeds are also great. Um, and so if, if you want a pretty quick answer on whether or not, you know, a, a meaningful check can come into your round, uh, I think that we're a great firm to come and talk to. And I think we di we distinguish ourselves by our portfolio. Um, like, it, I'm not sure there are many other funds. There's a couple, and, and we're friends with most of them, that carry quite as much breadth across the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we talk about um, diverse ideologies lending to better outcomes, our, our portfolio engagement across that group of entrepreneurs um, leads to some really fascinating conversations. Uh, that's a place I'd love to be a fly on the wall. Uh, and speaking of that, from the beginning of your time with Future and really in venture generally, you've had a very, pardon the pun, future forward and tech enabled uh, investment perspective. So at this point, I'd love to hear what have you been seeing from founders and from uh, innovators in terms of the next cycle of emerging technologies? I guess we'd just love to know what are you most excited by? Oh, I'm, I'm so excited about so many things. Um, we can take the next 10 minutes on this. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's incredible is, you know, even when we were raising fund one, I was basically um, given the kind advice from other peers in the industry to not dare put something like clean tech or climate tech in our pitch portfolio because and made people's skin crawl. Uh, and they just thought about the intensity of their losses uh, through the 90s and early 2000s. And in such a short period of time, right, effectively over the last three, four years, that has fundamentally shifted. And the thing that I'm most excited about is when I go and talk to university students about what you know they might be doing next or graduate students, it used to be oh, I want to work for SpaceX, I want to work for Tesla, uh, or I want to go into academia, right? There's like this very short list of kind of cool companies. Um, and now the answer resoundingly is, I want to work on something climate focused. I want to take my technical expertise and capacities and scientific knowledge, and I want to lend them to addressing challenges in climate. You know, before that, I basically only ever heard that about people who were interested in biotech, but were afraid of going to work for big pharma. 
Um, so I think that the extent to which talent is flowing into fields, we're only beginning to see the cusp of what might get solved. And I am so deeply hopeful about that. Um, I think, you know, the, I think this revolution in food is coming our way. Um, it's starting with um, all of the alternative proteins and, and the kind of clean meat products. But the, the evolution beyond that, like, I think we're going to start looking at the health of the veggies we eat and their mm -hmm. um, levels of uh, in, intrinsic hormone as a result of the stress that the plant was eating. Like, I, I think this question of understanding a whole system biology and all of the inputs and the outputs and the inputs being, you know, our own environment, our stressors, the foods we eat, uh, the foods we feed animals. I, I think we haven't even started scratching the surface of that. And I am so excited about a future where these things that currently feel opaque to us uh, and that people make best guesses at will actually start having meaningful, empirically derived science and then companies. I'm equally hopeful and inspired by your optimism. So if there's any way we can help push that forward, please let us and anyone in the audience know. And if you have an idea and you are in the audience, reach out. I think all of us would be interested to hear. Now, not to turn this around too much, but is there anything you think, maybe it's not it's not ready for prime time yet. It has a bit more uh, development to go. I think one that I'm seeing is, um, and, and, and let me caveat that I, I would be delighted to be wrong here, uh, because it, if anything, I, I think this technology that I'm about to talk to will come to fruition. I just think it's going to be longer and slower and take more time and have fewer hits than people are expecting. And, and I want to be wrong in all of those aspects. Um, but the thing that I'm talking about, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to abstract this, is this construct of drug discovery companies that are going to find novel, amazing drugs for us to cure whatever disease you want from some unique proprietary data set, whether that data set be uh, synthetically and computationally derived or from some subset of microbial organisms or some level of the mammalian kingdom that's uh, resistive to one disease state or another. I, I think the simple reality is while we're all living creatures and part of a deeply interconnected systems, um, a system, the, the, the human biology in particular seems to be sufficiently unique and not terribly translatable. And I think we've seen this um, in just in the challenge of taking uh, mouse models and, and saying that the outcomes from mouse models translate well into human biology. Um, you know, a little better in large animal models, a little better in non-human primates, but it, it's still, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And so I think these companies, of which there are several, and I think they're all really cool and quite exciting, uh, and the simple reality is that, you know, any one of them really only needs one, really only needs to get it right once. Um, mm -hmm. So there's something to be said for, for uh, taking the risk. Um, but I think uh, the market is maybe overestimating the value of some of these solutions and underestimating the translation challenge. I will second that. <laughs> uh, if no, if if I think data is powerful, I would fully agree with you. But I think the idea that we're going to somehow develop a novel data set or algorithm that completely changes healthcare as we know it is uh, we're a little early for that um, i think they can be informative absolutely and it sounds like you're saying something similar we have a ways to go also before even needing to understand how we can robustly characterize annotate and derive those consistent data sets across um, and design them in intelligent ways to inform uh, outcomes and i think we're getting there but i, I think i do think it's early yeah, absolutely. And the, the last point I'll make on this is um, I've seen so many brilliant 
really delightful experience, experimental data where, where it's like these very clear correlations of, you know, you have the cell and then you, um, you have some therapeutic action that you uh, put on the cell and then look, it gets better or it gets worse. And the challenge is that cell doesn't live alone in a vacuum in the body mm -hmm. and that anything that you apply targeting is hard, right? And so uh, this concept of um, uh, biologic solutions and therapeutics that don't address targeting and delivery and off-system effects, uh, you can have the most brilliant uh, solution on earth for you know a gut condition, but maybe it also affects the central nervous system. Uh, and so I, I am pro more whole system biology uh, experiments early on to address some of those off target effects. Oh, we could do a whole episode just on this. <laughs> and I think um, that's something we can definitely dive into more deeply, maybe at another time, because I do think there is, you're right, whole cell systems should absolutely be considered by the same token. I do think there's value in single cell perturbation and analysis and development as a starting point for for informing that whole system design and exploration. And so yeah, it sounds like you're, you're of a similar mind. So Absolutely, right? It, it, I just think the two need to exist in, in a confluence and comparison together. And, and when, I, when I see... Um, a group over indexing on one piece of data or not the other. I'm I, someone is going to ask you the question, right? So just be prepared for it. No, and and rightly so. But all right, <laughs> today we're seeing as much innovation in the science, <laughs> just as we were starting to talk about, uh, as we are in the business side, uh, especially in the life sciences. And I feel like that innovation can, at times, almost be ahead of the market especially as we consider commoditization and um, a, the changing paradigm of accessible precision healthcare. So, or even from, uh, as you were saying earlier, the uh, future of food space. So how do we think about and how should we think about various like go-to-market strategies, company journeys? How do we think about supporting this next generation of startups that not only have technical challenges, but are also going to have um, business challenges ahead? I, I think one of the best things um, that any of us can do in the space who are, who are either in a position of coming from industry or um, supporting entrepreneurs through uh, capital or other meal, means is ensuring um, graceful transitions into the existing industries. And so by that, I mean... It, it, yes, we, we want to upend the biomarkets as we know them today because maybe they're not fully in service of people in the best ways that they can be. But the simple reality is that Merck and um, you know Pfizer and Novartis, they know how to make drugs and uh, they have a lot of resources for doing so. And uh, partnering with them is, um, is not an evil to be avoided. It's a challenge to be navigated. Um, often and early. And so one of the things that we endeavor to do is help these companies with these kinds of early introductions, help them understand who in these companies can, can steward and field along and, and partner and partner in ways that are beneficial to both corporations. I, I, I do think that um, there's a way for the whole field to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 shift the the dynamics right so um, particularly in structuring of bio deals and I, I think an example is if you look at a company like 64x that um, Lex the CEO there she's just done such a spectacular job of kind of navigating her way through early, early bio partnerships and demanding rightfully so more and more value to her company as the company has achieved subsequent milestones so I think when tech investors and finance investors get involved in bio, um, they look at milestones and cringe as if those were bad things. Uh, the reality is they're also an opportunity, right? The milestone goes both ways. You hit the milestone, it unlocks uh, the the next set of um, capital and and uh, contract growth. And so, I, I would say that um, tech tech investors need need to figure out how to get milestones to work to their advantage. Uh, that's good advice, and. Let's dive in and ask, we've talked about emerging technologies, 
what about future? What's coming next for future ventures? Uh, well, first and foremost, our new fund. So we're, uh, you know, I, I think the third fund for any venture fund is a, is an interesting one because uh, you learn a lot about a partnership in the first two funds. And um, for us, it's it's stayed the course. What, what we're doing is working. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're, we're going to continue with our strategy and our team size and our fund size. And that means that, you know, we we are we will be entering um a period of thinking about what are what are the next emergent areas that we think are most interesting and relevant and i i think i continue to deeply be interested in uh, global food systems um in thinking about uh nutrition and health and biology but also thinking about the ways in which um particularly in 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 the bio biotech spaces that um that we can speed experimentation and and particularly how to how to think about longitudinal studies right um that we especially when you when you start thinking about disease states you know who who knows how and why epigenetics show up uh but you know as a result you, you need to do these longitudinal studies um that's expensive and costly and and has all these outcomes and so i'm i'm excited and curious about a future where our computational capacities start to accelerate our experimental capabilities. No, that's something I think we're all looking forward to see. And so before we come to a close, a few rapid fire questions just to cap things off. Having explored a number of VC families, as you said earlier, uh, do you have any advice for those who might be earlier in their careers and seeking to pursue venture? Find mentorship. Um, now, this is coming from a biased perspective, right? Everyone's path through venture is their own. Um, I know some brilliant people who just jumped right into it and started their own funds, and they're they're amazing, right? Uh, I have so much respect for those kinds of folks. For me, venture has been a, a, a path of craft and mentorship, um, and I've had the exceptional fortune uh and and luck to be uh mentored by by some of uh, the people I most admire in the field and so I would say uh, for a person their style their aesthetic around venture will evolve as a natural expression of who they are so it's important to have a couple of mentors of slightly different styles but they all have to be people you deeply respect and Working for a fund with a particular brand name is not nearly as important as working with a senior partner who you just really foundationally respect. No, that is great advice, especially if we're going to call this a family and you're going to work so closely together. So taking this in an entirely different direction and something I think we should have said up front, I hope your family, especially with everything going on in Ukraine, is okay. Uh, but coming from an immigrant uh, first generation background myself, knowing you come from an immig immigrant background, something I think, and I believe Sarah also first generation. So given I suspect we're all a bit passionate about supporting those who might uh, have the options of lawyer, doctor, or engineer in their future, uh, do you have any advice or thoughts for um, immigrants, first generation, young people uh, out there today? Um, you know, I, I find... Uh, and, and maybe this is, this is just the reality of when, when, um, your back's against the wall, kind of from a resource perspective of, you know, most immigrants just don't have a safety net. Uh, and so there's not a lot of option, like failure is not an option, uh, is maybe the, the, the trend I hear most. And so there's an amazing thing in founders, um, who come from immigrant backgrounds, just they're willing to kill themselves for their companies. Uh, I, I would say the extent to which you can learn to care for yourself, um, is probably one of the best things that you can do for the organizations that you're a part of, uh, and taking the time to rest, to pause, uh, to consider what you're doing, um, will enable you to have a greater clarity of thought, 
uh, and a more compelling directive to offer the rest of the people that you're working with. Um, because if I see any trend, it's that, um, man, that mindset is just so willing to put a nose to the grindstone and say, it's fine. Give me all of the jobs. I will do everything. Um, and that's great, but you cannot become the linchpin for your entire company. So learning to trust, to delegate, uh, to breathe and to, to take some time so that you can have the space for creative and novel thought, I think will be much more of an accelerant than just continuing to be committed to working 10 times harder than everyone else. I think that's advice I needed to hear as well. So thank you. Uh, and if I may build on that slightly, I'd, I'd also say, and it ties back to what you were pointing out around failure is not an option. You might not have that same safety net. It's okay to explore entrepreneurship because even if it's not going to pay maybe as well as going into a larger firm or there's a little bit less uh, certainty, you'll learn so much, be able to do and explore and build so many skills and network with so many amazing people. It will still work out on the other side, even if it doesn't go perfectly the first time around as a founder. Absolutely. And in fact, it, it probably won't go perfectly the first time around, but the, or the, third. the <laughs> experience, the connections, like it's, it's all transferable. It's every last thing you work on in entrepreneurship is the most transferable skill that you could imagine. And I think people lose sight of that. So I, I so appreciate um, that reminder. I kind of, I, I don't think about that as much because I find that the people who uh, are drawn to entrepreneurship, there's like a martyrdom in it, in the sense that like, they're not afraid. They, they don't even have a choice. It's the thing they have to do. Yeah. Uh, right. And so if you feel that internally, if you feel like, oh man, I just got to go do this. Um, you, you might as well start it because you, that feeling doesn't go away. No, it's true. And okay. We've talked a lot about the professional today, uh, a little bit about the personal. And so love to end there. How do you like to spend your free time? You've talked about the art outdoors, but maybe give us a little more color. Um, it was, it's my birthday this week. And so, Happy birthday. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for sharing some of it with us. <laughs> I'm so delighted to. Uh, and so this, this weekend, uh, rented a, a little, um, Airbnb right on the beach, um, in Northern California in this little town called Bolinas. And I am really looking forward to waking up, drinking a cup of coffee, reading some poetry, surfing until my shoulders give out, uh, and then sitting around and just chatting with dear friends. Like, that's a perfect day for me. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful one. All right, Mariana, before we come to a close, any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs? Anything you want to share about your work or that of your portfolio companies? Oh, man. Um, I, I'm i so grateful to you guys for, for this organization and for the work you do. And, and um, you know, I, I think these spaces lack community and a cohesiveness of thought. And so I really appreciate the work you're doing in it. I think we're, we're doing our own work to try to build these communities as well. And so the things I've said are interesting or if our portfolio companies are interesting to any of your listeners, whether it's to invest or to work with um, or uh, just to get to know more about. I am always excited to be an evangelist for any and all of them. And to the same extent, if you're one of those people with that sinking gut feeling of this thing really needs to exist and no one seems to be doing it, and I guess it's going to be me. Uh, yeah, shoot me an email. I want to hear from you. A great note to end on. So thank you again, Mariana, for an absolutely fantastic conversation today. Very grateful for your time and happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.